Who are you going to believe? Your lion eyes? When you watch the bright spherical orb go across the sky every effing day for a million years in a row? Who's right here? Isn't it true? Isn't it, we all, don't we all know that the earth travels around the sun, or that the sun travels around the earth? Of course, all the scientists agreed. Until what? Until we had a different perspective. And it's just simply a different perspective, just like the earth being around. Just a different perspective is all. Oh. And I could give you, I could spend the rest of the class giving you examples, but we all knew for sure as scientists 100% all the scientists agreed until we all agreed that no, what we saw was absolutely wrong. The things we perceived were absolutely wrong. There really are things smaller than we can see that cause disease. We're not witches for thinking that. We really can fly around the earth above ground and hover. All these things that were impossible to do become very possible very easily. But yet here we are now Saying what? All the scientists agree. And I go, okay. I prickle a little bit. And I say, no, they don't. And even if they did, I don't give a crap. Because I'm a critical thinker. And I go, Let, let's see what's going on here. And I know it's tough. Because we have to do something based on what we know, right? You can't just deny everything and lay in the, you know, eat bonbons and do nothing. But a healthy amount of skepticism and criticism is what we need in, in everything in life. But that being said, where was I? That was a, that was a tangent. <laughs> we were talking about the earth going around the sun mm -hmm. a priori, a posteriori. Um, Which one do you mean? Oh, the world, yes. Yeah. Which one do we, that's it. Which one do we leave? This is an a posteriori world. You see that? Everything we think we know is based on what we see, what we touch, what we taste, what we hear, what we feel. Those are the things that are truth. Truth are the things that we can do with our five senses. That's truth. The things we can measure and touch and feel. That's truth. Is there a God? Well, I don't know. Can we measure him and touch him and feel him? If not, there's no God. According to this world, right? How do we prove something's real? We have to be able to measure it and play with it and touch it and tinker with it. But the reality is, that's not true. All of your other teachers are going to tell you this. Science is truth. And remember at the very beginning of this class, I told you that science is not truth. Science is, in fact, the only thing that we prove <coughs> wrong every single time. Every time we think we know something's true, science goes, ah, oh, crap, we got it wrong this time. But next time we'll be the right one. And we always think, whatever it is, that we've reached the age of enlightenment. Now we know everything. Those idiots last year, they didn't know shit. But us now, now we've got it figured out. Trust us on this. Really? Okay. Let's talk about some of those things. For example, can I move from one side of the chalkboard to the other side of the chalkboard. If I'm over here, can I walk to the other side of the chalkboard? Actually, it's not a chalkboard, is it? It's a dry erase board. Can I move from one side of the board to the other? Why would you think that? Because you have legs. <laughs> it's like a song, ZZ Top, right? Because I have legs, so what? That doesn't mean I can move. We watched you walk to that so that's you fine. saw it, right? Why else would you think I could do it? You've done it yourself, right? You've experienced it. You've seen other people do it. 
your experiences tell you that you can do it. Right? Your five senses, all the things that you know to be true based on your five senses tell you you can do it. Logically can I do it? Rationally can I do it? What do you think? Based on rational laws, the answer is no. Absolutely not. You know that. You all know that. You've already been taught that. Right? If you're right here, on this side of the chalkboard, I'm sorry, board, and you want to go over here, which I just didn't do, <laughs> to this point over here, it's impossible to do that based on what we know to be true a priori. Intellectually, it's impossible to do that. You know why? Because between this point and that point is what? A halfway point. And I would have to pass a halfway point to get to that point. Right? That seems like no big deal. But what's between this halfway point and my starting point over here? Another halfway point. And what's between this halfway point and my starting point? And what's between here? And what's between here? And what's between here? And what's between here? And here and here and here and here? How many halfway points are there on this line? How many points are on this line? There's an infinite number of points on a finite distance. There's an infinite number of points. Is it possible for me to travel and traverse and pass an infinite number of points in a finite amount of time? Answer? No. So who's right here? A priori tells you it's impossible to pass an infinite number of points in a finite amount of time, yet we all go, oh, shut up. Why don't we all go, oh, crap, you're right. And there we have it. We can't move. How about this one? What is this? Solar system or an atom. an atom. It's also what the universe looks like. We have a re repeating patterns, right? <clears throat> Larger, smaller, smaller, smaller. It's the same repeating pattern. We have a nucleus, we have a sun, we have the planets that go around. Then we have the nucleus, we have the electrons that go around. We have, I mean, these are repeating patterns that we see, which some people say hints of design. Interesting. Others say happenstance, I don't know. But the question though that I have for you is how much matter is in this? How much matter is in this? Not very much, right? Very little bit of matter. How much distance is between here and here? a huge amount of distance. In fact, it's the same distance as the planets are to our sun in proportion. And our solar system from the other solar systems in our universe. How much space is out there? Think about that. Tons of the amount of matter in this in our universe versus versus space way disproportionate. In fact, the same percentage is this. Most of this is wide open space, very little matter in here. What is a table made up of? What is a wall made up of? Atoms. How much space is in there versus matter? Mostly space. In fact, vast gaps of space like our solar system. 
if I'm made up of the same thing as that, what's the odds mathematically that my matter is going to bump into that matter when there's such huge gaps between it? It'd be like taking a little pebble and having a big chain link fence, except the chain link fence, instead of being this far, far apart, your chain links are 50 feet apart and taking and trying to hit. How often would it hit? Never. Once a million throws, right? So mathematically speaking, we should be able to walk through walls. The matter should just pass through. It shouldn't ever bump. It should never hit. But for some reason, I walk into the wall. Why is that? So you think they bump into each other? No, that's just what I heard. I've learned. They do move fast. But then so does, you know, the planets and the sun. It's all moving quite fast. These are just these are things that intellectually, a priori, we go, well, I, I, what we see versus intellectually what we understand are two different things. Another one is Let's say you're in a race, and you're chasing somebody who took off ahead of you. Can you ever catch that person and pass them up? Not as long as he's moving. As long as he's right, if he stops, you can. But if he's continually running, it doesn't matter how fast he's running, you can never pass him up. You know why? Because to pass him up and you're chasing him, you'd have to get to this point, right? Where he was. Wouldn't you have to get to that? Yeah. And in that time, finite amount of time that it took you to get from here to where he was, what's he going to do? Gone. He's going to move. And so on, and so on, and so on. It doesn't matter how small the point is, that small bit he's going to have moved. As long as he's moving, you can never pass him. You'll just go, get up to him, and then, yeah, and never be able to pass him. Because be just ever so slight, you can never be able to pass him. Based on the fact that he's moving, you always have to reach the next point where he's at. Intellectually, you understand that, I hope. A posteriori, we say, but we see it happen all the time, which is right. I don't know. But we all say, ah, that's tough when you do stuff like that, so we're just going to ignore all that stuff, and we're going to go with the a posteriori world, and we're going to act like this other stuff doesn't exist. Well, if the laws of thermodynamics are true, what are the laws of thermodynamics? Mm -hmm. I didn't realize it was that late. <laughs> Crap! Okay, we'll talk about laws of thermodynamics later. <laughs> just no, 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 no! I got a couple, get up a couple things just real quick uh, that I want to make sure you, I talk about real quick. Last thing I want to talk about, just real quick. Five minutes. It's the allegory of the cave. Who's heard of the allegory of the cave? Is that the one where like when the guys are like chained in the cave and there's like a fire and they can only see the shadow? That's right. Who came up with it? I don't know. <laughs> Plato. Plato talks about the allegory of the cave. And he says, there's this big cave. And inside the cave, there's this rock. And there's a fire. And there's two kids that are chained on the backside of this rock. They were taken there when they were first born. And they were chained up on the backside of this rock. And all they can see is the wall over here. And people bring food to them and water, and they just live there, and they've never seen anything other than the wall cave, the cave wall. And people come in here, and they take cutouts of the things on the outside. So they'll take a cutout of a dog. Whatever a dog looks like, right? 
and they put the dog and it projects up on the wall a shadow of a dog from the fire. And they take a tree and it projects a tree shadow on the wall and so on. So their whole life is just these black and white or shadowed images of things that are on the outside world. And that's how they know their outside world or their world is just these two-dimensional black and white shadows that they're familiar with and they're comfortable with. And they live their whole life like that until one of them breaks free and he gets out and he runs out of the cave and he breaks out and he sees a real tree and he recognizes it. But it's not what he saw before. And he all of a sudden he sees that it's three-dimensional. And he feels the bark, and it's rough, and it's brown, and it's coarse. And he looks up inside, and he sees the branches coming off, and the leaves fluttering in the wind, and the sunlight beaming through. And he sees the bright green colors, and he smells the wind. And he looks down, and a dog comes up, and he recognizes